Welcome to science class. Today we are going to learn about parallel and convergent evolution. Whereas homologous structures are derived from a common structure or ancestry, parallel and convergent evolution are sort of the opposite of that. Take these four animals, the hedgehog, the tenerec, the porcupine, and the echidna. All of these animals share a common feature, which is that their hair follicles have been modified to become stiff, sharp, hard quills. But these creatures did not evolve from a common ancestor that also had quills. Porcupines are rodents, found in the Americas. Hedgehogs are part of an animal order that includes shrews and moles, and are native to Africa, Europe, and Asia. Tenrecs are part of their own very small order of mammals that look like shrews and live only in Madagascar. And echidnas are monotremes, egg-laying mammals, native only to Australia and New Guinea. They each independently evolved spikes derived from hair follicles. Eyes are another terrific example of parallel evolution. Eyes have independently evolved something like 40 times in the animal kingdom. The compound eye of insects, the pinhole camera style eye of the nautilus, the compound eye of the squid, and the compound eye of vertebrates all evolved separately, which is why the way each eye works is so different. Wings are another great example. Insect wings, bat wings, pterosaur wings, and bird wings each evolved separately. Each of those organisms evolved from an organism that couldn't fly. Today, I want to try to go further than just looking at individual structures. I want to show you how many animals have evolved in a way to copy another organism entirely. Let's get started. The difference between parallel and convergent evolution is not always so obvious, and I'm not going to obsess over my examples being one or the other. In simple terms, convergent evolution is when two organisms of different classes evolve the same characteristics. Classes for animals include, but are not limited to, mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and fish, although there are actually many classes of fish. So the fact that pterosaurs and bats independently evolved flight by modifying their arms and adding large membranes is convergent evolution. Parallel evolution occurs when animals of the same class evolve the same characteristics. The spiky-haired mammals I gave before are all examples of parallel evolution because they all began as mammals and evolved the same characteristic. Shortly after the airplane was invented, huge numbers of extremely bizarre looking aircraft were made. Shortly after the car was invented, the same sort of thing occurred. In fact, cars powered by steam and batteries made up a very large portion of the car market more than 100 years ago. And there used to be hundreds of independent automobile manufacturers in America, all making very different looking vehicles. But in both cases, what happened after a few decades was everybody converged on similar styles that happened to work best. Planes and cars need to be safe and efficient above almost anything else. And there are only so many ways that that can be done. Similarly, when the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct, mammals exploded with diversity. There had been mammals for as long as there had been reptiles, but they didn't have the chance to diversify because of competition with dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and the marine reptiles, the mosasaurs, ichthyosaurs, and plesiosaurs. Huge numbers of mammals began to diversify into the multiple orders we see today. Now there are flying mammals and aquatic mammals along with the land-dwelling ones. A similar thing happened to birds. As niches opened up, birds could now more rapidly diversify, even to the point where they lost their characteristic ability to fly. Penguins are so well suited to the water that it isn't hard to imagine that in millions of years, they will become a brand new class of animal that isn't even a bird anymore. I bring up these examples because for animals to do animal things, sometimes there's a best way to do them. So why does a wolf look like a wolf? Well, they live in general in broad open areas where they need to have the muscle and bone structure suited for chasing down large prey over long distances. Dogs have incredible stamina, much more so than cats, because cats tend to be ambush predators whose hunts last only a few seconds. One of these pictures is North America, where wolves live, and one is Australia, where no wolf has ever lived. The fact that you can't tell which one is which is kind of the point. 
We discussed already how Darwin thought it was bizarre that there were no rabbits, for example, in Australia, because they would obviously do so well there. Wolves would likely do just as well in Australia. In fact, it's for certain they would, because what happened was an uncannily wolf-looking animal did evolve there. And then we sort of killed all of them. I'm going to talk about Australia for most of this video because it was home to some of the most fantastic examples of parallel evolution. Before humans showed up around 60,000 years ago, and then much later when we started importing animals around, Australia did not have a single placental mammal species on it. All mammals in Australia were marsupials or monotremes. The only marsupial that existed outside of Australia was the possum, and the only monotremes outside of Australia, echidnas, live in both Australia and New Guinea, but that's because those two land masses used to be connected. The point is that marsupials and the other placental mammals diverged from each other a hundred million years ago, and all but just one of those marsupials had been isolated in Australia for many millions of years. This was basically a natural experiment. How will the marsupials and the rest of the mammals throughout the world change over time? And it turned out, as they changed, they became more similar. You've probably heard of the Tasmanian tiger before. Its proper name is the thylacine. Most of these Australian mammals have terrible misleading names, but for a good reason. The thylacine was indistinguishable from a canine to most people, but it wasn't. It was more closely related to a kangaroo. Just look at the skeletons of the thylacine and a coyote side by side. Here are the skulls of a thylacine and a wolf. They evolved all kinds of phenotypic characteristics that dogs possess. There was also a marsupial lion. Terrible name because it's not a feline, but it mimicked large cats so well. Its more proper name is Thylacoleo. It had the characteristic short face and large fangs. It even had retractable claws, something that no other marsupial ever evolved. There still is a marsupial mole, again, terrible name, but it is so similar to true moles that taxonomists couldn't help themselves. Sugar gliders have evolved the same characteristics as flying squirrels. In the countries of Borneo, Sumatra, the Philippines, and Vietnam, and a few others, there's a really bizarre mammal called the Kalugo that has done the same thing, and we have no idea what other mammals the Kalugo is most closely related to. There's also a saber-toothed mammal in Australia that very closely resembled saber-toothed cats. While saber-toothed cats are a type of cat, Thylacosmilus wasn't an offshoot of the Thylacoleo. It was an entirely unique cat-resembling marsupial. That's like double parallel evolution. Two marsupials, each evolving their own cat-like traits. In the end, convergent and parallel evolution are each about exploiting niches. No other mammals were living underground, so the marsupial mole began doing it. And it turns out, moles look the way they do because that's the best way for a mammal to look if it lives underground. So the marsupial mole ended up with the same body plan as true moles. There are a lot more examples of parallel and convergent evolution, especially with plants, but I'm going to save those for the classroom. If you're not a student of mine, then check out other videos on YouTube about parallel and convergent evolution. Trey the Explainer has a particularly great video on the topic. Next time, we are going to look at evolutionary milestones and discuss why they were so important in shaping the biosphere. Thanks for watching.